Hi, good, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Candace Bennett and I work for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, and today I wanted to take some time, really excited to talk about uh, wildlife photography and photos, uh, but respectful and ethical ways uh, to take those photos and some considerations that you need. So feel free, since we have a small amount of people, to hop in if you have questions. Um, it's, you know, this should be learning and informative. Uh, this, I really like this comic because I think it kind of exemplifies some of the, you know, if, what, what it would look like, I think, if animals had something to say about us all taking photos of them. So what I'll cover is I'll cover some regulations and laws that are associated with, uh, with uh, wildlife photography and things to think about, the ethics of taking uh, wildlife photos and photography, um, talking about um, understanding wildlife is such an important part of taking photos of uh, really great photos that represent wildlife, uh, and then some of the considerations uh, that, that I make for, uh, for uh, wildlife photography on the equipment that I have and when I'm out in the field and things like that. Uh, so there's, there's several different state and federal laws that regulate how we interact with wildlife. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, and then sometimes there's permits that are required depending on the location that you're at or the type of photography that you're taking. Um, and then also wanted to cover, there's a lot of interest lately in uh, photography contests, some of the rules that are associated with that. So when you're out in the field, if you're capturing photos just for your own personal self, or you want to enter them, like the like one of my favorites is the comedy photos of wildlife. Have you guys seen those? They're hilarious. They're really good. Just animals doing funny things. So here in Washington, one of the first questions if you're taking photos of wildlife, if it's for personal or for professional or commercial purposes, is, is always asking yourself if the animal that you're working with is a listed species or a regulated species. So for example, um, if it's a gray wolf in the western two-thirds of Washington, they're actually still considered an endangered species. Um, or if they're a hunted species like elk or deer, uh, they have regulations associated with them and how we can interact with them. So one of the laws in particular uh, is re really going with the Endangered Species Act. Um, is it an endangered species? There's a thing called ESA Species Take. That also includes harassing wildlife um, or maliciously harassing to take photos or their nests or things like that. So making sure that you're really cognizant of those types of, of regulations and laws. Um, another one too that's a fairly recent law in Washington is not baiting large carnivores. Um, and so if you're putting out food uh, because you want to catch a photo or for hunting purposes, you're not allowed to do that because it can cause a safety issue. Uh, so making sure also some of our the southern resident killer whales, um, there's rules associated with how close you can get to, whether you're in a kayak or a boat. Uh, and so making sure that you're careful of that. And then one of the other things, uh, working with Department of Fish and Wildlife now for about seven years, uh, is, is if you know we're out on scene, this is actually a photo of a moose that I worked up. Uh, several years ago by Northwest Territory or uh, Northwest Boulevard in Spokane um, of a situation where officers were telling people, hey, get away from this news because she's injured. Um, and so making sure that you're following those rules and regulations um, because you can, you can get an infraction or consider a missile. So then there's the next umbrella up, which is federal law. Same question, you know, is it an endangered species that you're working with? A grizzly bear, for example, which we do have in Northeast Washington. Um, there's very specific rules, whether it's a mammal, there's migratory birds, um, also to endangered species, just like there is with the state. But there's also a rule that's very specific, and it's actually pretty broad, about teasing, harassing wildlife. Um, and that this also applies on parklands and laws and things like that. So making sure, you can see this photo is a photo of people taking pictures of a, of a bear, a black bear actually very too close um, in Yellowstone. So, and then kind of going out from there, um, if you're a commercial photographer, so you're, that, and that definition means that you're taking photos to sell them, um, whether they're on your cell phone or not. Uh, there's, there's rules and regulations associated with that. Uh, so with the uh, national parks, it's a $50 fee. Uh, we have to have insurance. And so just making sure that you know these rules. Um, an example of an international rule, other than getting visas, like if you're going to Africa or things like that. Uh, in Northwest Territories, a situation with uh, somebody flying a drone to, to, to take, take pictures of the wildlife there. Uh, and I'm just as distracted by the dogs back there too. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're, they're interacting. <laughs> um, but uh, in Northwest Territory, it's a free permit, but it takes about six months to get permission to take to take pictures of the wildlife because they had a situation where people were harassing uh, grizzly bears with drones. We should bring them down. Um, so just knowing these rules. Um, also, photo contests. Any photo contest that you enter, there's a, actually a pretty long list of rules. Um, the, the biggest thing is, is that they're really looking for this honest exchange, or this honest uh, example of, of wildlife. Most of these pictures in this presentation are ones that I've taken. Um, some of them are not, but you really, you know, they prohibit baiting, they prohibit harassment, um, and you can be disqualified for those types of things. So I always, always like to kind of get the, the rules and regulations out. This is actually a really great uh, infogram from the Park Service um, about uh, all the places where it's okay to pet bison. Um, you know, so it, it, it's actually, if you read it, there's nowhere on there that says that it's okay to pet a bison. Um, but in all seriousness, they actually had to put this out because of some very serious things that have transpired. Um, and so I, I like the underbelly one. That one's a pretty good one. <laughs> All right, so ethics. Why are ethics important? So these are different uh, articles, and then I'll, I can talk to you about some other things, uh, some personal experiences. So Kroger, Kroger National Park, do uh, you guys know where that is? It's in South Africa. It's uh, one of their big national parks. They're even recently looking at ways to protect people, to protect wildlife, and so they're, they're doing some things like a lot of the national parks in Africa now, you're not allowed to get out of the vehicle um, because of situations that have equated to people and, and wildlife issues. Here's another example of a guy trying to take pictures of a caribou, uh, too close, feeding deer, feeding animals, and some really great pictures, um, but are they really great? Are they a true representation of, of the animal? Getting a little closer to home, uh, this just recently happened, uh, people were in Yellowstone, there's a video that you can watch um, of a, of a nine-year-old girl being thrown into the air, about 20 feet into the air by a bison, um, because they were too close. Um, and so it is, it can, as, as you know, we don't hear a lot about this, but when you start looking, it's actually really terrifying. This is the one, this is the moose uh, off of Northwest Boulevard in Spokane several years ago. Uh, what had happened when I got the call at about 7 o'clock in the morning, I got the call from the city police saying, hey, there's people that are too close to this, this moose. Um, we think she's injured. When I showed up, there was a mom with two kids about 8 and 10 years old within 10 feet trying to take a picture of the mom with the moose. Come to find out, uh, this, this moose uh, had the night before somebody was trying to film it, chased it into the road and it got hit. Uh, this moose unfortunately had to be because of that. She had two compound fractures in her leg, uh, and you know, there's no rehab for adult moose, um, or even a moose of that age. This is another example. Uh, this is actually in the basin of a burring owl, and a lady that was turned in for trying to get the burring owl to fly because she wants this beautiful picture of a bird flying. They're an endangered species. Um, this, there was a lot of concern about overstress on this bird. I'm sure she got some great shots, but at the cost of at the cost of herself and, and the animal. Here's a personal experience. This is actually an a African bush elephant um, in Namibia. Last fall, I spent about three weeks in Africa um, doing photography, but then as on my own, and then um, also in the wildlife conflict stuff when I was there. Um, I got to spend uh, those, that time with uh, two different groups of elephants. There's about 115 of them left in the world. Um, they're very specialized desert adapted elephants in these ephemeral riverbeds, which are basically just dry riverbeds where these animals like to stay. And in this group, a beautiful photo of this calf and this calf, there's about 24 animals. Um, my last day there, they don't get to see people very often. Um, we're about about three days away from their major city, um, so we're pretty far out. Uh, we saw the first tour guide that we could see the whole time with a group of eight people in one of the open cab vehicles, revving their engine and trying to get them to, to, to trumpet and run at the truck. Unfortunately, two weeks later after I left, a, 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 a tourist was killed by that same group of elephants. Um, can you say that it was because of that type of activity? Not 100%. Um, but unfortunately, there are real, true consequences sometimes, and we'll talk about those here shortly. So ethics, why are they important? Well, they're important for your safety, and they're important for the animal safety. So in the situation with the elephant uh, that happened this last fall, 
you have a scenario where that elephant now is already ramped up, had a negative experience with, with a very similar type of rig, and you know it may not have directly affected those tourists, but it affected the people to the unfortunately, in a very, in a very sad way. Um, and so there, just because you may not have an interaction at that time, doesn't mean that that it can't happen later. And so really being cognizant of, and if you don't know, ask. Um, I, I'll leave my information, feel free, you can contact me anytime if you have questions about the locations that you want to go, things like that. Um, the other thing, and I keep stressing this, is you really, when you're taking pictures of, of wildlife, whether it's for your own personal, because you want to remember that, that inner encounter, or you're doing it to hang it on the wall, or give it as a gift, you want it to be a true representation of that animal and their behavior. You don't want it to be something that was manufactured, or something that was, um, you know, that, that has isn't actually an honest encounter. So here's another example of honest, honest encounters <laughs> of, a, of you know, a joking around about creating this false nest so that people can be distracted by it. Interesting enough, there's actually several species of birds that do create false nests, like marsh wrens, which you can see out at Turnbull and other locations, um, where they'll create false nests so that predators don't, they, they have a less likely chance of finding the eggs they young. Um, so even though this is directed at, at photographers, I feel like it's also true to tools in wildlife. So understanding wildlife, I think it's one of the most important things when you're going out to take pictures of wildlife. Um, you know, knowing where those animals are going to be or what animals you're going to encounter. Um, most of the national wildlife refuges, what our WDFW lands, uh, Cobble National Forest, or other locations, you can actually either contact a biologist or customer service is fantastic. Um, you can contact uh, all of those different places that have wildlife in the area to get a list of species that you may encounter. And so read up on those, uh, on those animals and then also ask, hey, can I talk to somebody who knows a lot about, are, you know, are the moose here this time of year? Are the tundra swans here this time of year? And we're more, all of us are more than happy to talk about wildlife. So feel free to ask. Um, another thing too is, is so not only knowing about the animals you're going to encounter, start listening to vocalizations of birds, for example, or different types of, so like moose have very distinct vocalizations, elk, things like that, so that a lot of the times, especially with birds, you're going to hear them long before you see them, and then you get a sense of what's out there. There's a lot of really great apps out there that can help with that, and I rely on a lot of those um, for work, but then also on my personal time as well. So, and then as you're learning about the species that you may encounter or that you want to encounter, know about their life history. Is it breeding season? Are they going to have little ones? Um, all of those things not only play into some fantastic photos, but they also help you keep the animal safe because female, female moose are very, 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 very protective of their calves. Um, just like bull moose, when they're breeding, actually stop eating for three weeks, so they're understandably a little crazy. Um, and so knowing those types of things is really important. Um, also too, you can start learning about their behaviors, what behaviors are when they're breeding, behaviors when they're stressed. Um, those are all things that any of us can help you out with, um, or you can find a lot of it on the internet. Um, and then how do these animals use the landscape? Are they using trails? And a lot of us know where those things are, um, different park rangers, things like that can help you out. Um, but also when you're out in the field looking for tracks, game trails, that helps you set up a good spot to take good photos. Um, and then time of day that you're planning on going can really determine what kind of animals you're going to see. And then once again, kind of see now, are they here, are they migratory, is it a good time of year to see So understanding stress. Um, I can't, this is such an important part as well. Um, you can see in all of these photos, these animals are stressed, all of them. I mean, it's kind of easy for the tiger to tell that the tiger is stressed. But look at the bear, does that bear look stressed? Most people would probably say no, but you see that his lips are out, he's actually chattering his teeth on the moose. Uh, a lot of people, when they look at moose, they think they're cute, they're really adorable animals, but this moose is extremely upset. She has her, the hackles up on her shoulders, her head is down, her ears are back, she's sniffing her mouth. Um, those are all in indicators that these animals are stressed. And so there's, that's a short list of different types of things that you can see with those animals, barring their teeth, their kinds of vocalization. And lastly, depending on the type of species it is, are they running away? If you're running, running away, you, you may have just blown your spot for at least a little bit, but don't follow them. Um, we've had a lot of situations where people want to follow, like that moose I explained in Concord, uh, in the Boulevard. People 
chased her, she ran, went into the road, she got hit. So making sure that, that you're being careful of that kind of stuff uh, and not following them. So I love the ghillie suit idea um, to hide yourself when you're taking uh, pictures. Uh, I will say a lot of the times I'm taking photographs on my own, it's a lot of things. Uh, and you don't want to blow your cover. Um, so some of the things, thinking about equipment, um, so I have some of my equipment here and I'll go over some of it. Um, I'm a minimalist when I'm out. Uh, I, I usually try to take the least amount of possible because that's usually I'm hiking into an area. Um, some people kind of have a hundred piece kit and I, that's, not, that's not how I do it. But thinking about the camera body that you're taking, thinking about the types of lenses and I'll go over those. Um, but then also thinking about, am I taking a tripod? There's also window mounts. There's other things that you can take to really get great shots of wildlife. So think about the area that you're going, the time of year, your equipment, have you taken it out in the winter? Um, is it gonna be wet? Um, all of those types of things. Um, and then more importantly, I think a lot of us forget sometimes is the proper equipment for yourself. Um, making sure that you have good clothing, keep it dry, keep it warm. But more importantly is, you know, I always carry bear spray with me, whether I'm at work or whether I'm taking photos. Um, it's extremely important. Uh, and then, you know, a first aid kit, there's other things that you can take, but I do I do bring those yeah. every time I go. So cameras. Um, so in the age of technology, there's many ways you can take pictures of wildlife. Um, so there's your cell phone, there's uh, like my camera, my personal camera is a DSLR camera, there's now mirrorless cameras. Uh, I'll do a demonstration right here and I'll see if you can hear. I'm sure you'll be able to hear. Uh, one of the things when you're out, you don't want to keep yourself up, or you've maybe lost your chance to take pictures of them, is the sound of the shutter. Um, so on your cell phone, and you can see in this first picture, that's a picture of your cell phone, you can actually turn off the sound of the shutter. Um, it's not, but I'll, I'll show you what it sounds like when uh, you go. Very loud, very, very loud. And I will tell you, animals will hear that in a second, and you're done for the day. Um, and sometimes I can actually, when I was in Africa, um, I can quiet mine down a little bit. I can't actually make it completely silent, even on the quiet setting, um, which on these cameras, on the Nikons, um, it's called Live View, and it's a little button back here. So like the Canon, like we have here, um, there's other types of settings. So many, all of them have different types of settings. The mirrorless cameras, which are kind of the new thing right now, are for the most part silent. Um, so you don't have to worry about the shutter noise, you know, giving your spot away or disturbing the animals when you're taking the pictures of it. So uh, DSLR, this type of camera. Also, the mirrorless, they call them uh, interchangeable lens cameras. Um, these obviously have interchangeable lenses, um, but they, that's just the dimension for the mirrorless now. So one of the determinations that I made because I didn't want to disturb wildlife is, is a long lens like this. Uh, so this is a 60 to 600. I prefer the, the lenses that give you a mirror view only because if I have to, so there's other type, the other type of lenses are like a 600 millimeter. So it would be the same as this one completely far out. However, uh, what they do is you have to want a better shot. That's a problem. <laughs> when you're taking pictures of wildlife, if you're having to get up to back up and get a little closer. I prefer I prefer to zip line tours. They have two zip line the little passes. Kind of HD video. You can film your adventure come with it. So this is kind of adventure alley over here. We've got some skydiving, zip lining, so head over and take a chance to win if you have to come on Tour, it's awesome. It's fun. It's I don't think I can hear this on the be terrified at <laughs> so, Great time. So some of the other things too when you know when you're learning your equipment or learning, even if it's on your phone, um, you know, spending some time before you go out to see how it functions. Uh, because a lot of the time what happens with wildlife is it happens quickly. And so knowing how to set up your camera, um, you know, depending on if I'm shooting birds, I usually have a faster shutter speed because you want to cut them down a little bit, um, unless 
keep up. Depends on the, the scenario. But um, there's other types of there's tutorials now online that can help you. Uh, there's a lot of resources available. Good, are you? I'll keep it busy. This is actually a, a setup. Some people, and it's kind of the most minimalist setup I can find. I want to do this. Like I said, I'm a minimalist when I go out. I usually don't even bring a tripod with me. Um, it's usually the camera body is multiple, uh, battery is multiple, uh, storage cards, and then usually two lenses and that's it um, when I go out. But uh, if I have the luxury of taking a tripod and things like that, I, I will um, if I'm in the front country. Um, other considerations too, a lot of the wildlife viewing areas now in eastern Washington and throughout, throughout the country too and, and the world, they have lines where you can go. You can always contact, there are their pre set up lines where you can go and observe wildlife or observe waterfowl. Um, and so they're great opportunities where you don't have to bring in a lot with you and it's already set up. And those locations are set up because they have a really great biodiversity there as well. Um, and so they can help out with that. You know, I added the safety kit again because I'm really like it's really important that you're making sure that you're bringing that kind of stuff in. Um, so in the field, you know, one of the biggest things, uh, I love the situ situational awareness product. Uh, <laughs> in the bottom, I'll read it too because you probably can't see it. It says, because you never know uh, when something uh, when something comes up behind you. <laughs> because it, it really is, and it's a penguin coming up. Because really it is. I, uh, you know, I, when I was in Africa, one of the biggest things that I learned when I was working with elephants was they, they the researchers and the, the other people, the conservationists that I was there with, said, always keep something near back when you're working with elephants. Because when they walk, you can't hear them. They're silent. And so it's one of those things, knowing your animals, having good people that are with you if you don't know it. Um, and then always being aware of your surroundings. Uh, so I put that in there, being vigilant, situational awareness, um, letting people know where you're going is really important. Um, you never know if, if you have, you know, if you slip and fall or you're late uh, or things like that. So having ways to communicate with people, um, even if you do have self coverage. Um, and then, like I said, looking for areas that are established viewing areas are really great opportunities to kind of learn or just go and see some incredible wildlife because they're set up for a reason. Um, and then also to finally just giving wildlife their space. The, the benefit of having a big lens like this uh, is a benefit that you can, you can keep your distance, you can watch the animal, watch for those types of behaviors, and they're doing it naturally. They're not doing it because they're being forced or they're stressed or they're upset. Um, and so, and, and really time, practice, and patience are the biggest things um, when it comes to, to great wildlife photography. I, when I was in Africa, I took 15,543 pictures, so a lot of time and a lot of photos. Um, and you just, you get, the more and more you do, the better you get. So, any questions? This is actually one of the elephants that I took when I was there. She was the first elephant I saw in Africa. Pretty special. So. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you work for Washington? I do. You do? I do, you, yeah. You did? No, I do. Okay, I still I'm do. Hard to <laughs> hey, that's okay. I still do. Is this your part of your job? Uh, so the photography is not, I'm a wildlife conflict specialist, but I will say that a big part of my job is actually interacting with people that are taking pictures of wildlife and human conflict, so. So, yeah. so and then the photography stuff's just stuff I do on the side. Do you know how the feed of wildlife got started? Uh, uh, so I have heard a little bit about it, but do you know? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and share with everybody. Um, I know that, so the large carnivore piece was actually more specific to people like bears getting into garbage um, and things like that, but it has a benefit, I think, just in general that you're not attracting large carnivores. The major problem started when the super, the major part of that started when the superintendent of Yellowstone ran ads around the world promoting come to Yellowstone and hand feed the bears. Oh my gosh! So he has a Go ahead and introduce yourself. Because and, and so we researched that we now know how to safely hand feed bears. <laughs> and the message is very simple. <laughs> Always use the hand you don't run. <laughs> right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So is your talk later today? Pardon? Are, are you giving your talk later? I'm an exhibitor. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, any other questions? Is, is this a growing problem in Washington? Yeah, I would say, um, so I've been a wildlife conflict specialist for seven years with, with WDFW. And I would say, so I, well, I started in the Spokane, so a lot more people, kind of stuff like that. But in Washington, only 3% of people hunt. Most people are outside recreating, biking, hiking, doing wildlife, all of these camping, all of these things like that. So it actually is a rising thing. I would say in the summertime, if there's not a week that doesn't go by that I have a scenario like this that I have to deal with. Um, where, and it's, it is, like, people don't, don't realize that, you know, the stress that you're putting on animals sometimes, or the potential that you're going to cause this animal harm, or it's going to harm somebody else later, grows each time it interacts with people like this. And so giving them that space is so important. Um, it's important for your safety, it's important for the next person's safety, but it's also important for the animal because like that, that moose, we had to put her down. There was nothing we could do for her. Um, we had other scenarios like that, but I would say it's, it, it is a growing problem. Um, people taking, you know, selfie sticks, being out, uh, thinking that it's cool. That, you know, how many of you seen the photo of the bear at the, at the picnic table? Everyone thinks that's really cool. It's actually not a good thing. Um, you know, there was a, a video, I want to say last year, of the seal, uh, the, or the sea otter, where, you know, it's, oh, this cute sea otter, and people are, like, come up on the boat and they touch it, and the thing freaks out. And it's, so animals are, they're pretty resilient. However, there are a lot of scenarios that we deal with that where the animal is injured or causes a problem.